Hello everyone and welcome to Phoenix Gaming. I am your host Nick Henning and today we are talking about the definitive Earth strategy guide using Earth and oh my god my copy is still in shrink. Hold on I need to address that. Before you go running off uh, wondering like how can I talk about Earth having not even unwrapped my copy of the game yet I have we'll point out some creds here. I've played you know 180 games of Earth. This is uh, I guess I've played four times in person so I've now played 183 games of Earth um, and I have 114 victories uh, uh, across those games which I think is actually a pretty good ratio for this game um, this is uh, an ELO rating that puts me at 31st 33rd um, in uh, in BGA world which is I think to say that the Earth like ratings are on the lower side this is a game with higher variance so I would expect to see sort of like lower ratings in this kinds of game. Um, but yeah, pretty good win right there. So I do know what I'm talking about. It didn't take crazy long for me to shoot up. And so I actually think that I have a lot that I could share with you in this video. It kind of stagnated over a long period of time after this, because I do think that you hit a very real ceiling here and probably getting you know a higher rating than this is about sort of applying really, really marginal differences. I'll say in the past couple of months, I do think that I was paying more attention to sort of like small little things here and there that did give me extra edges along the way. Um, but that being said, you can learn the majority of the stuff like literally from this video as I'm about to share with you. I think that if you're looking at the statistics in uh, these kinds of things here, if you're one of those BGA folks, I don't think that there's a ton to glean here. I'll maybe make one or two references to this um, data sheet, which is which just prolific. It's got a lot of stuff going on in it, but I think mostly is not terribly helpful. I'll also point out that primarily I play three and four player games with a, a brief run of when I wanted to try to do some arena stuff, which is, which is always foolish, but mostly three and four player games. And this video is geared towards multiplayer commentary. If you want to think about two player, it is going to be different um, as all two player games tend to be. So that is going to be the focus of our video. While I'm taking the shrink off of this, I also want to say that I think it's important to acknowledge that Earth is a game that I'm not sure fully wants to be in the competitive space. What I mean by that is that, like, I think this is a fun game. I think it's more fun when you're playing a little bit more casually with your friends and family. And if you employ some of the strategies that we're talking about today, like planting when your friends are broke... Um, they might end up having a really bad time and not wanting to play with you again. So I do think that it is worth absolutely considering what the scene is that you're playing with when it comes to this game. You can, um, people are going to probably be most satisfied playing this when they feel like they have the opportunity to uh, develop their whole board, right? That the, the concept of like putting all the trees down and all the sprouts that are there is actually not something you're going to do in most competitive earth games. Um, that is a uh, part of the, the kind of arc that is there. So it's something to consider while you are, you know, playing this game at home. I do think that it's feeling is going to be different than the competitive aspect. But that being said, with that disclaimer, let's dive into what we're talking about today. So if you've watched a lot of videos on my channel, you know that I have this kind of concept of the grand valuation theory, understanding the core components in a game is really important. So we're going to start off by that on your player board right here, um, talking about what I think each of the values of the different pieces are in this game. And a lot like Wingspan, most of the things in this game are worth one. When you look at how good a card is, you can kind of just count how many minuses versus how many pluses, and that's roughly how good the income of the card is. And if you look at a ton of the cards, they give you one sort of a thing. Um, but those things are not created equally. They're created almost equally in a lot of instances, and you can shortcut in a lot of ways. But it is important to understand the little nuances here. First of all, it blows my mind because the most important picture isn't even on here at the bottom. It is the soil picture. So soil is the most important resource in the game by a large, large, large margin. At the beginning of the game, you'd have to trade me something like four, five, or six victory points, maybe even more than that, um, for every soil that I'd want to get. And so uh, soil is worth one soil or whatever, but it doesn't compute very well to victory points because it allows you to play the game. It is really the only resource except for drawing cards, which I'll get into a little bit later, I guess. Um, and it is it is really the most important. Like You need to have access to soil. Everybody needs to have access to soil. And how much soil you need does depend on the cards in your hand, but you really can't go wrong with more soil. Um, short of it being the last couple actions in the game and you already having sufficient soil to play the cards in your hand to kind of finish the game out, 
you're never going to be in a bad place by having extra soil along the way. So soil is uh, not the end all be all, but it is pretty close to it in terms of income stuff. When you're looking at your initial things in this game, just getting more soil is best. And in my sort of grand valuation theory things, usually I'm looking at things in terms of victory points or in terms of resources. Like if you watch that video, you know that I'm comparing resources in Arnak with one another um, or in Wingspan, you know, how much is a card versus a food versus an egg or anything like that. And in this game, soil is is kind of like since it's the primary resource it is it is the oil that makes the entire engine run right um sprouts are really interesting sprouts are worth you know roughly plus one right they're worth one victory point they have one small limitation which is that you need to have space on your board in order to make them but you really only need a tiny amount of space on your board essentially once you have six uh, spaces for sprouts on your board, you have the most capacity you really do actually need in the game because a sprout is two thirds of a soil, right? Every three sprouts you can convert at any time into two soil. That conversion is really, really important. And it basically means that you're always happy to get sprouts. Sprouts are just a slightly worse version of soil at the two thirds ratio. Um, but also they have the flexibility of being victory points. So the game tricks you into thinking that there are victory points that have the flexibility of being a soil. I would recommend that you change your perspective on sprouts to they are soil, bad soil, with the perspective to be victory points that you can just kind of cash in whenever you need to, which will be probably often and prevalent. Um, composting from the deck is very straightforward. It is worth one point, right? It's going to go into your personal compost. It is worth a point at the end of the game. There are a few cards in the game that change your evaluation from compost uh, because you really want a lot of cards composted, maybe a certain fauna like the mole or something like that. Or you have cards that demand that you consume your compost to trigger their abilities. But most of the time you'll have sufficient compost to do that. So I would say in 98% of games or whatever, Composting is worth one point. Um, composting from your hand is strictly worse than composting from the deck. I don't think this is much of a surprise. It requires you to have something to get rid of. Generally in this game, you have the opportunity to draw a lot of cards and you're going to draw a lot of chaff, stuff that you're not interested in playing, and they can go into the discard pile pretty easily. I would say very low amounts of composting from hand are basically just converted into points, but anything that goes beyond like one compost per like round cycle starts to get into the territory of like, do you have the right cards to compost? Do you have extra cards in hand? Do you have these options? Do you want to diminish your choices later on? And I would say in terms of rewards, this is by far the worst of the rewards that you can get. And more often I view this as a cost, but do note that it is worth a point and uh, it's not necessary. It's not strictly bad to have hand composting abilities. In fact, plenty of times it's good as long as you have sufficient cards to use it. So I think it's probably the hardest to evaluate in the game, but it is um, not great in terms of I would never pay to do this action. Or maybe not never, but I would very rarely ever pay to do this action. Um, Gaining growth, this is worth a point. I think this is somewhere where the game designer and I greatly disagree on how good growth is. First of all, it's very flashy. It looks great on the table, right? These pieces, go find them, are the coolest. Like, this is the thing that makes you stop and be like, oh, what game is that that people are playing? So, you know, props to Inside Up for figuring that out. But that being said, they're worth one point. Now, some plants convert that you know, three points into five points or whatever, right? Those plants themselves are are worth extra points. But I would just consider that plant to be generating extra points with the growth as like a requirement to do that. And I think just considering these to each be worth one point is better, right? Like this and this to me are the same thing. Um, drawing a card is the second most important thing in the game after getting soil. You need to have access to a bunch of cards. It is... Very, very, very helpful to have options in this game. The cards are not created equal by such a long shot. The, the the deck is so, so skewed. And what kinds of cards you want at the beginning are different from what kinds of cards you want later. And even between the cards that you want early and the cards you want later, they just, they're just not 
balanced against each other at all. And so drawing cards minimizes your opportunity of not drawing something you want. And a lot of this game is playing into situations where I'm not in the position where I don't want to be in. And I know that's like a lot of negatives there to essentially say, um, you just you, you just need to be in spitting distance, right? Most of the time, if you're in spitting distance, you're still in the game. This game punishes people for stumbling and drawing cards limits the chance that you're going to stumble throughout the course of the game. Um, drawing cards is the only other resource that really matters except for soil in terms of playing the game. You can get by in this game with not drawing that many cards if you're very lucky, but I think that it that drawing many cards, it minimizes that variance, it minimizes that chance um, that you're going to not essentially have exactly what you want to have throughout the course of the game. And so having those options is really, really important, especially when I break this game down into the mid game. Um, drawing a card is by the game standards, again, also just worth like plus one, I would say. But in the beginning of the game, this is as good as getting soil, I would say. In the mid game, it really drops off. And at the end game, drawing cards is actually worth absolutely nothing. So unlike soil, the value of drawing cards does distinctly drop off near the end. Yes, there's a chance you'll draw into something pretty exciting, but those percentage points get much, much smaller. You want those options early in the game. So by the time you hit the mid game, drawing card um, going from mid game to late game turns into like a nearly worthless activity. This planting card action is not something that you see on anything except for the action itself. So I'm not going to talk about it in kind of the grand evaluation. That's that's not really anything that's too helpful. And then spending composts. Well, if you've been following along, essentially I've been saying these are worth getting one point, right? Because they go into your compost. So spending compost is paying one point. And as you know, in most games, paying points is worth infrastructure, If it helps you get to where you're going throughout the course of the game, I would say in Earth more than other games, I would happily pay these points to do the things that I want to do, getting soil, drawing cards, um, or maybe even just getting other points, depending on what it is that uh, the card itself is doing. But it can be very easy to see, oh, okay, I pay one point here and I get two growth. That is a plus one point action with kind of like an extra hurdle in the middle there. Since we're talking about points, let's like make a target for what we're scoring. 200 is the number you're looking at. Every game is different in this. You can win with 160. You can win with 300 or whatever. But 200 is the score you're looking for. I don't think that's necessarily that helpful to know, but sometimes people really like to have that anchor. All right, I think this is one of my core lessons of Earth is that Earth is about the journey, not actually the system or structure that you've set up. I want to compare this to a couple other games that I think are are good comparisons. One of them is Wingspan. Wingspan's got the same, have a lot of cards, trigger things. But Wingspan is on a specific timer. You know, you're trying to score the maximum amount of points that you can over that period of time. And a very real strategy, at least in base game Wingspan, is... Filling up that egg row and jamming the egg row as much as possible, kind of maximizing your turn-by-turn points. That's not really how Earth works, and I do think that it tricks people a little bit, or at least our knowledge of other games tricks people a little bit into thinking that that is what this game looks like. Having a very powerful action in this game is not as important, because you're not actually going to fire off your very important action that many times you are only going to be able to fire it off once or twice by the time you have like everything fully activated and the marginal difference that that's going to give you versus your other opponents is not large enough to actually be super duper impressive i think another good game to compare against is race for the galaxy which is probably closer and that the tempo timing of the game ending is player controlled we're sharing the same actions with one another from having chosen what actions we're doing how it happens is a little bit different across those games but the comparison there is is more about the idea that you as players have some control and you're trying to take actions that are more efficient than your opponent's same version of those actions throughout the course of the game um that is a little bit of a trick here too because you know a lot of times what happens in like race for the galaxy is like oh, okay i'm doing trading or consuming or i'm doing a heavy develop strategy or whatever and you kind of tend to like go into these tracks and be very good at these specific actions but being good at actions is not really what you're rewarded for in earth either it's kind of the common theme across this wingspan and race for the galaxy comparison instead it is about this journey of are you meeting your uh i wrote flora here but i mean fauna 
Are you meeting your fauna? Um, you know, your fauna conditions? Are you meeting the ecosystem conditions? And these are going to be huge, huge, huge points that you're going to make at the end. Remember I said you're probably angling for about 200 points. Well, if every one of these brown cards is 15 points and you hit all four of them, that's a third of your final score. Now, of course, you're not going to do all that by yourself, but the odds that these guys are going to add up to a total of about 40 of your points, 20% of your score is really high. These guys, each of these cards can be anywhere from... 10 to 25 points and so let's say that each of them are maybe worth 20 you're going to have your personal one plus two in the board that's another 50 60 points right there and so we've got 20 percent of your score here 25 percent of your score here or something like that and already we've talked about half of the score in this game is just from this journey of meeting these conditions I said I wasn't going to talk about these BGA stats too much, but this is, I think, the most important part, what I have highlighted here. The number of times people have chosen this various action before the end of the game. Plant, compost, water, and growth. And we see that everybody understands that taking the plant action is by far the most important action. We're going to get into that in a minute. Um, but, you know, five times a game, you will take the plant action, right? Something like that. The number of times you're going to take compost over the course of the game, well, if you're me, it's one. If it's all the rest of my opponents in the world, it's two. So I'll get into why that's the case later. Watering action, that's about one time a game. Growth action, it's one to two times a game. Um, and again, you see that I have this philosophy of playing plant way more than my opponents. Um, that's not actually true. I play plant less than my opponents. But how can I do all these things less than my opponents because all my games go faster than the average person playing on board game arena? And so if we look at this in ratio, right, five actions on plant, one, 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 five actions, two, one, two, um, my games end up being five, eight turns versus 10 turns, right? So um, playing at kind of a different clip, but the core concept there is still the same, that we are taking the plant action a lot of times and building up towards a good compost action, a good water action, a good growth action. These things are not going to pay dividends in the way that they would in Race for the Galaxy, in Wingspan, in so many of the other games that you play. What you want in most of these cases is to be good enough that when you or your opponents take this action, you'll get some rewards for it, right? But it doesn't, that's not going to be your infrastructure. I'm not going to play like a blue focused strategy this game. That is a trap. All right, so if you've played any amount of Earth, you know this is true. If you read any Earth strategy guide online, you know this is true. Planting is king. I want to talk a little bit more about why planting is king. And later in this strategy guide, we'll talk about what to do when you cannot be the plant leader in a game and how you can keep up with something like that. But planting is really powerful because of all of the things that it gives you over your other opponents, right? It's not just the action itself. It is the delta that it creates between you and all the other players who are taking the same action as you every turn throughout the course of the game. Planting is the only action in the game that guarantees that you are going to get double what your opponents are doing. You play more cards than they do, right? You're playing two to their one. And it gives even more than that because if you have more cards in play now, it means that when your opponents take actions that are not planting, you are more likely to get more perks than anyone. So for instance, let's say we all planted red cards and then my next opponent wants to take a red action. Well, I now have two cards that trigger off that red action, whereas they just have the one. That core concept is, I'm distilling it down, making it a little bit too simple by saying, oh, we've played the same cards of the same color. And of course, maybe that person would be smart enough to say, well, I'm not gonna take the red action because it's better for you than it is for me. But the leader actions in this game matter so much that that player might be in a position where they have to take the red action. They really need the soil and you're just going to get the extra benefits that they're not going to. So playing more cards than your opponents, not only does the I play two, you play one, it makes it so that other actions taken, you're probably going to continue staying ahead in pace and tempo of them. It's why first seat in this game is so powerful compared to the other seats in the game. The second thing is the drawing thing. So after you take a plant action, if you're one of the follow players, you get to draw one card. If you are the lead player, you draw four cards and keep one card. Now in most board games, I would describe something like draw four, keep one as maybe worse than draw two. I think in a lot of games, draw four, keep one or draw two cards is a pretty close decision. In Earth, 
draw four, keep one is almost the same as just drawing four cards. That is a very bold statement. I think there are very few board games that are like that, but Earth is one of them. And I think there's two primary reasons for this. One is you will draw so many cards in a game of Earth, not in every game, but in the vast majority of the games you play, you will draw so many cards that you will not end up playing all of those cards. And because you have this abundance of card resources, you're not drawing. Drawing is not valuable because it gives you more cards. It is more valuable because it gives you more options. This is really different from most other board games or card games, right? A lot of competitive players come from like the magic world where they're like card advantage is king. And here, card advantage is not the best because you have more cards. It is just the best because you have more options and you can play to the perfect thing for the stage of the game that you are at. Um, again, if you're very lucky, you don't need to draw a lot of cards, but even just being modestly lucky, having draw four, keep one, and keeping the best card out of those is great. Sure, it feels bad when you draw four awful cards or four really good cards and you only get to keep one of them, but most of the time, this is just as powerful as a draw action as the actual draw action in this game, right? The yellow action that does growth. This is nearly as good as that. Staple onto another card already. The third thing, and this is, I think, again, probably pretty well known if you've played the game a little bit, but the ending game rewards in this game are really good. Like, frankly, too powerful in my opinion. Um, if you're the first person to end the game, you get seven points. Now, that's not that many, but uh, by the end of the game, I mean, like, fill out your tableau. That's not that many points, right? Seven points in 200 is not a huge, huge difference, um, but it is significant and, and, it is generally a larger delta than any action you would take. So you might say to yourself, oh, I want to take the blue action so I can plant sprouts and score points. But if you count up the board and you count your opponent's blue actions and your blue actions, how often is you taking the blue action worth seven more points than your opponent taking the blue action? Um, that's including the six bonus points you get for taking the blue action itself. It's pretty close most of the time. And so just planting is really good for that. The second is the fauna race, and we're going to talk about this more when we talk about the mid the bid the mid game. But getting to these fauna before your opponents is worth several points, right? It's not only worth extra points for you, but it is worth f fewer points for them. Um, and this is a game because you want like I expect most of the people are going to get most of the fauna. I would expect everyone to get three or four of the fauna in almost every game that I play. That difference in points, it can add up really quickly. By planting, you are more likely to get to those places first because a lot of those cards reward you for having played X number of cards that do this thing. Um, other kinds of fauna reward different sorts of things, but the majority, I think, reward having played a bunch of cards. And then the third thing, and this is the thing that I think is most subtle about the ending game bonus, is that finishing the game is not about just these seven points. It is not about getting the most points on the fauna. It is about the fact that your opponents might not finish the game. If everybody ends the game with a 16 tableau, then the difference of being the person who ends the game is not as significant. But if I end the game with 16 cards and you end the game with 13 cards, that can make a huge difference. Not just because of the couple cards played, because honestly, those three cards played might be only worth like anywhere between zero and five points. Um, but... Those cards may have made it so they didn't hit a certain fauna, may have meant that they didn't meet certain ecosystem requirements, and those differences there, that is really, really powerful. So that's part of the reason why planting is so important. The fundamental strategy, if you just stopped listening here, is try to plant as often as possible. Do not be the person who can't plant when your opponent has uh, is taking the plant action. So what do I mean by that in the tempo says? So let's talk a little bit about planting tempo, particularly in multiplayer games, much, much harder to control than it is in a two-player game. So essentially, the question that you have to ask yourself on your turn is, is there a reason I shouldn't take the plant action right now? And a really obvious reason is you have no soil and you need to get access to some, so you need to take the red or blue action. Another reason is that the cards you're going to play are expensive or bad for one reason or another, so do I need to draw cards and take the yellow action? But if those, the answer to those things is I can plant, then probably you should be planting. However, you do need to pay attention to the opportunity that your opponents might have to prevent you from planting when they take the plant action, right? If they take the plant action and you are broke, you have nothing in your hand to play, you can get into really bad trouble. 
um, that basically costs you a whole turn. It is it is as expensive as having um, taken the plant action with like no leadership, right? Like it it can be a death knell in a game for an opponent to take the plant action and you have nothing to play. Um, so I want to talk about like some scenarios to, to pay attention to this. I have a rule of thumb. This rule of thumb is bad. I'm sharing it with you, but don't take this as like a hard thing. Is that if an opponent has five or fewer cards in their hand, oh, my hand looks funny there. If your opponent has five or fewer cards in your hand, they have one card that costs three and everything else is more expensive. Why do I assume that? It is because if they are down to five or fewer cards, they have probably already played most of their fewest cards and they are very, very limited options. Now, if they have something that's cheaper than this, great, fine. Um, you know, I, I I, don't think that I'm, I, this is like a great rule, like I said, but there's an opportunity if they have five or fewer cards in hand and they don't have access to three soil, they might not be able to play anything and that might make it very valuable for me to take the plant action and jam them up. If they have about 10 or fewer cards in hand, I'm going to assume that they have probably about two very cheap cards and, you know, at least one modest card. Zero cost card, a one card, and a three card. Something like that. If they have 10 or more cards in hand, I'm going to assume that they have the cheap cards that they need. So I'll just assume that the cost of their cards are zero, one, two, and three. Um, but they might even be cheaper than that or rebate things or, or whatever along the way, right? Um, I can use this information to estimate based on how how many options I think my opponents have. Um, and you can expand this knowledge by having paid attention to what cards they've played recently. If they've played cards that cost three, four, five, six soil and leave them with very few soil left over, unless the ability on that card is amazing, it suggests to me that that opponent has very limited options and is kind of broke. This is actually the thing that helped me win the final um, of this when I played at WSBG is that because my opponents had to play cards that were not ideal, a little bit more expensive early, it told me that the rest of the cards in their hand were cheaper. So paying attention to what you think they have based on the cost of things that they're playing is helpful. But let's say I don't really have that information or people have been playing normal cards or it's like right at the beginning of the game or something like that. And I'm player one here. I have five so soil and all my opponents have five soil. Is it dangerous for me to plant here? Almost certainly not. Here's why. I'll plant my two cards. Maybe they cost me a total of three soil or something like that. Puts me down to something like two soil. And this opponent's going to play something that maybe puts them down to about three soil or something like that. Maybe even less than that. Maybe they just paid zero or whatever. And it's going to be the same for my opponents kind of around the board where they've paid, you know, somewhere between one and three soil to play a card into play. Maybe they've paid upwards of four, but it like gives them a rebate or something like that. Who knows? Whatever. So everybody's played a couple soil. Now, at this point, we go to player two's turn. And on player two's turn with three soil, I think that it is quite plausible that player two has two cheap cards and would take the plant action again. At this point, putting them down to nearly zero soil. Player three, however, goes down to maybe two soil, something like that. And I'm just making up numbers here, obviously. But at this point, I might be broke. Okay, and then player three in this instance at two soil might have the opportunity based on their hand to take the plant action. And now I and player two are sitting at zero soil with very limited things to do. So what's important in this tempo flow here where I'm left with some soil and all my opponents are left with some soil is I have to ask myself the question of, do I think that player three has a lot of cheap things? And if they do have a lot of cheap things, I might be in a position where I can't play stuff and I need to be wary of that. Um, it is hard to like absolutely prognosticate all this stuff and you can't just be fearful um, that you're going to, you know, get jammed out of, of planting. Um, but having a sense of where other folks are at are very important. I've presented a situation here that is quite nebulous, but let's assume one that's a little bit cleaner. Okay, in this situation, player two and four are down to one soil, whereas player one and three, both of us have five soil. If I take the plant action right now, the opportunity that the next player after me is going to take the plant action is quite low. The idea that they have three um, zero one cost cards in hand and then would be willing to do that knowing that going into player three might force them to play a fourth 
plant card means that if I take plant here, I'm pretty safe. I think that player two is going to do something to get them some soil back, which is more or less going to guarantee that player three is going to plant, right? This is going to look like planting, not planting, probably get soil. And if this player is getting soil, probably everybody's getting soil. And then that means that this player is going to have rebated some of their costs. So they're going to take the plant action. And then the real mystery here is what happens with player four. But who cares? Because by the time player four comes around, I'm the next player and I have control of kind of what happens after that. So the only situation here that seems really bad is if the cards I would plant in my hand would make me absolutely broke. And then I think player two, for some reason, is not actually taking some non-planting action. Um, this kind of understanding of the flow and what other opponents are able to do is going to dictate the course of the game. Let's do another quick example and then we'll move on from this. Okay, we're going to say that player two has 20 soil. I am player three of five soil and player four has no soil. But player four just took the planting action. So one thing that's really interesting about this is that player four put themselves into a dying position. Right? If I take the plant action, then they might have just hosed themselves. So I have to assume that unless player four is just really bad at this game, they actually have something that they can play for free. Maybe even that rebates them some soil. Um, one of those really good cards that gives you a couple free soil when you plant it. Entirely plausible that player four is just completely safe and they know that they're safe and they're making themselves look weak. So I'm not so interested in this stage about hosing player four. We're going to take them out of the equation for a minute. The one thing that is nice about them being at zero, even if they can rebate something, is that if there's some plants along the way there, it is a lot less likely that they're going to plant on their next turn. So that's what we've pulled out of player four so far. Player two is going to plant pretty much no matter what. If they're at 20 soil, there's really absolutely no reason why they're going to do anything that isn't plant, even if I take the plant action on my turn, um, unless they're doing something very wild. I'm expecting that that's the action that's going to happen next. So we know that planting here is coming. And we know that probably not planting is what's coming for player four around the corner, but they are safe along the way if there's some plant actions. I really want to take the plant action here and probably can as long as I have three cards that I can play between player one and player two's turn. But it becomes really dangerous if player three then also takes the plant action. If I don't have four cards that I think I can play, I'm asking myself one of two questions. How likely do I think I'm going to draw something dirt cheap from the deck in the top four cards that I rip when I take the plant action? And you might have a higher odds of drawing something that's very cheap if you have some discounts or a good island that discounts various types of things. Um, or are ambivalent about what fauna come into play. You're just kind of like racing towards the end of the game because you already have cards that match the various fauna or something like that. Um, so I might feel safe then. I also need to assess kind of how player three has been doing. When player four just planted, what were the costs of the cards that player three played? Did they get any rebates that put them to five or did they have a bunch of money, play something dirt cheap or play something medium costing? Um, you know, usually my instinct is that I'm going to play if I have like, let's say eight soil and someone else plants, I'm going to play my card that costs, you know, somewhere between zero and four that does the most. So did they just play a card that does something pretty impressive, but costs four soil? Yeah, they probably still have some dirt cheap cards in hand. Do they have 10 plus cards in hand, 20 plus cards in hand? Okay. Now I think that it's really likely that player three might even come in and plant after player two does. So what's most important for me here is to assess how player three is playing this game and deciding whether I'm going to take the plant action right now. But if I can't convince myself that I'm going to be in trouble, my default action should be to plant. All right, so let's transition into talking about what you're looking to playing into your tableau in the early part of the game. Obviously, the biggest limitation here is do you have these cards? So drawing into these cards is really helpful. That's why this game is very lucky. Having cards that cooperate with the game plan early is the most important factor in terms of whether you're going to win or not, and you don't have a ton of control over that. But knowing what you have and whether you have the access to kind of push this or whether you need to maybe draw some more cards is a really helpful thing in terms of understanding how am I going to get my game plan started in the beginning of this game. The three things you're looking for are green powers because they're going to trigger four or five times more than every other power in the game, cards that give you soil and card draw because having those extra options is really powerful. Having that extra cash, I'm gonna call soil cash, is really important. And having cards that are dirt cheap, 
Yes, I'm going to keep using this pun throughout the course of the entire video, but cards that are dirt cheap are like giving you soil, right? Anything that is cheap that goes into play, it, it just makes it easy, right? So playing even cheap stuff that is bad is sometimes better than playing expensive stuff that is good. Anything that hits multiple of these things, a dirt cheap, soil gaining, green power is the absolute best thing that you can play at the beginning of the game. So let's run through a handful of cards and talk about why these cards are all nuts at the beginning of the game. Grassland is uh, one of the best cards you could have at the beginning of the game. Every single time someone takes a plant action, you get plus four thirds of a soil, right? Because every so every sprout cube is worth plus two thirds. Now the problem with grassland that does make it awkward is that if you are not first player, this can't be your first plant because you have nowhere to put these sprouts. So I actually really like grassland as a card. I think that it is interesting in terms of how you play it at the beginning of the game, but absolutely one of the best cards you can play at the beginning of the game. Mountain Forest is green, but this is an example of a card that I'm not as excited to play at the beginning of the game. It's not expensive, but it's not dirt cheap either, and all it does is give me victory points. It'll give me a lot of victory points over the course of the game, but not that many that early. So this one is a much tougher call, and I would only play this one early if I had other cards that were cheap that I could take advantage with it. Shrubland is a no-brainer. It's one of the best cards in the game. It is very cheap to play. It gives you soil every time someone does something. If you literally played no orthogonally adjacent bushes to this, this card would still be one of the best cards you played all game long. Prairie is the same kind of thing. Having that early card draw is really important. It's a little bit more expensive, but absolutely playing this out is super important. I apologize that the uh, red screen that I'm using is not cooperating very well with a lot of the terrains. They don't... Uh, like that coloration. Extinct Volcano is expensive and it lim limits you from taking the red action, but the rewards that it gives you on the plant action are so insane. It's constantly giving you soil back, so do I really care that I can't take the plant, the red action? And it's giving you more victory points. This is one of the most nuts cards in the whole game. It's Brethren, the Fertile Rainless Land is exactly the same. This gives you plus two soil, right? It's like two thirds times three um, every single time. Or those things could be victory points. You can't take the blue action. Who cares? This card is very expensive, so getting it down early is challenging. But if you can, it's a really good chance you're going to win this game. And their other brethren, which is a little bit weaker because it only gives you a card draw constantly. Uh, but you won't need to take the yellow action because your card draw is solved by this card itself. So if you can play any of these three cards, you're in really, really good seat um, throughout the course of the game the green cards that are a little bit more sus i talked about the growing one and that one's okay this one is probably the worst of them because yes you get to trigger it a lot but you might not have as many cards particularly early in the game to mulch from your hand or compost from your hand i say mulch all the time um so these are ones that you can probably leave on the shelf for a little while but they're worth it more in the mid game Cards like Japanese Andromeda, which really don't like the red screen because that's a red plant, <laughs> um, are really good because uh, it gives you lots of soil and it's dirt cheap. This card, right? A lot of red cards here, dang. Um, let's you draw a card and it's like relatively cheap. This is a card I like to play early. And then later in the game, you can't really see it, but lets you mulch cards from your hand if someone's taking, sorry, later in the game, mulch cards from your hand if someone's taking the red action. Uh, again, apologize for the red screen here. It's, it's only so good. I couldn't do a green screen for obvious reasons. Um, Japanese Maple, I think, is one of the hardest cards to evaluate early in the game because it gives you a little bit of soil and a little bit of points, and it's not quite dirt cheap, but it's not expensive either. This is a card I'm always perfectly content to play but i'm happier to play it if there's some reason i really need those growth tokens if there's some reason i think that the yellow action is going to be taken more than normal in the course of the game i'm not usually super juiced to play this card but it does do a fair amount for not that much of a cost and so if i'm going to play this card it has a lot more to do does it match the fauna do i have other better cards to play but it's reasonable to be playing early something like tiger orchid is a lot harder to evaluate because this action of plus two um uh, uh, sprouts, which is four thirds of, of a soil, um, is pretty good, but this costs seven, which is maybe too much for me to be concerned about in the early game. And by the time I could afford to put this out, maybe later in the game, it might not be worth it anymore. Um, something like water lily is amazing though, cause it's just plus soil across multiple different actions and it's pretty cheap. 
Um, this card is really difficult to evaluate. It's something that I'm a lot more likely to play if I have something like Japanese Maple, because now all of a sudden I have a way of converting those growth things into three soil abruptly on the yellow action, um, which can lead to some really great circumstances if I, player one, am broke and player two is broke and I take the yellow action... They are probably still broke and I'm not anymore, which means that they're not going to plant. So now all of a sudden, what are they going to do that's going to make it maybe player three is going to plant? It is really good in terms of like getting soil on non-soil gaining actions can be very powerful because it throws off your opponent's tempo throughout the course of the game. Brittle Prickly Pear is one of the best cards you can get in this game. Plus three soil on a red action is really, really good. It's not as good as those green actions that are going to be triggering constantly over and over and over again. But this makes it so that your opponents are choked out from taking the red action. Or if they do, it's probably better for you than it is for them. Jalapeno, I think, is really difficult. Uh, can we do that? Okay. Really difficult to evaluate because paying a soil sucks but if you have no way of drawing cards this is really nice so turning the red action um which doesn't draw cards right normally we draw cards on the yellow action into get a little bit less soil but draw some cards gives you a lot of powerful versatility similarly making this kind of valuation for strangle tear which is free um is is makes this all of a sudden much better and it's got the space here for you to take a blue action so these are the kinds of cards that i'm looking to play early in the game or the ones that i've caveated along the way all right so let's talk about getting to the mid game what the mid game looks like is a little bit different based on if you're kind of the plant leader but let's say that mid game is around having half of your tableau planted and that's obviously just nice because it's mid, but I don't think that it's that inaccurate. Once about eight of the cards are planted, the game is really accelerating towards a, a closing, right? The number of actions you'll need to take to have the soil to pay for the rest of the cards is fewer because you have access to more card draw and more soil gain now. And so the second half of the game should be faster than the first half of the game in terms of having planted things out. So I would say that around eight cards is a good time where you're sort of like, transitioning over actually i think you could argue that it's even earlier than this the first four or five cards i play i really want to be those early game cards but then you're looking towards doing this mid game stuff anyway so uh let's let's maybe amend and say after your first four cards somewhere between four and eight cards played we're talking about the mid game and so the main things that i'm looking at here are things that are fauna pleasers that allow me to win those fauna races right so i mean what i mean by that is like cards that allow you to you know have uh two or fewer things on them because that's good for the western moose or cards that are even right or cards that have a color in their name or whatever it is right um blue cards for the kingfisher or whatever and you want to be paying attention to these things even in the early game but in the early game i'd rather play the things that are most important to me so if your early game cards are also fauna pleasers then you don't need to transition into like the mid game not that it matters it all kind of blends together um until later but if your early cards don't please fauna but they are very good that's cool just around card four or five or six start transitioning to cards that are doing this fauna pleasing stuff if they please multiple fauna or if they please a fauna and an end game ecosystem goal even better that does count as as hitting multiple things just like we did in the previous one the other thing that we're going to be playing in the mid game here are just role players stuff that make our geometry like the structure of our board which we'll talk a little bit more later um work or car they're they're fine cards but they just help things keep moving along for that third point about keep it rolling we want to play things that are cheap we want to play things that just kind of accelerate our game plan or more accurately not even accelerate our game plan don't get in the way of our game plan um those are the kinds of things that are really important so let's run through and talk about what i mean by that the first group of cards here and by the way i've removed the red screen because it was not cooperating so apologize for the glare that we'll have instead um are the keep it rolling cards right so this card is very very cheap right lets you draw some more cards and just kind of make some options out of that with a pretty good point ratio i love playing this card in uh the early game cards like volcanic ash plane volcanic grounds and red gram are absolutely nuts in the mid game because they are very very cheap cards that immediately rebate you soil or sprouts which is just soil as i've said a million times and they allow you to just play a card out and continue rolling if these happen to also be fauna pleasers or work out well with your geometry that's even better 
um, that should make these cards really good. Green cards are still good in the mid game, if, especially if you're starting around cards four, five, and six. There's still plenty of time that the green action is going to be triggered between now and the end of the game. And suddenly the cards that I was kind of poo pooing a little bit in the early game become pretty good. So this is just going to be generating extra points throughout the rest of the game. And uh, all of a sudden this card becomes much, much stronger. I normally wouldn't play a card like Harry Crabgrass because five is pretty expensive for a pretty bad power here, but it is worth six points if crab matches things. Um, if like, right, I want something that says crab, the animal cards, and also this card like met an ecosystem thing. That would be a reason that I would consider playing this card. It's a double fauna pleaser or a fauna pleaser and an ecosystem pleaser. Um, I might actually consider playing something like this. I think a card like Reddish Corky Fungus feels even better, a little bit cheaper, so it keeps it rolling a little bit more. Yes, it's worth fewer points, but it generates probably more points over the course of the game. I guess it does depend on how many cards I'm mulching out of my hand, but I can really consistently count on this to score points throughout the course of the game. And it's Reddish, which might be relevant for me, and it touches a lot of different habitats, which might be relevant for me. So this is the kind of card I really like in the mid game. Milk Cap is another great expensive, uh, inexpensive card uh, that just is worth a couple extra points, right? It's two points itself. It'll make two extra points when you take the yellow action, which probably won't be that much by the time we hit the mid game, but that's okay. Heather is a card that's kind of on the fence here. You know, drawing an extra card, as we said, is nice earlier, but like drawing an extra card on an action where you're already drawing cards isn't quite as good. The red action of like mulching cards from your hand is like fine. Two soil for two points is fine. So I'm really hoping that this hits something else. I probably wouldn't play this unless it was also a fauna pleaser in some way in the mid game. Um, but cat grass is dirt cheap and scores extra points or soil throughout the course of the game. So I absolutely would. I haven't talked about these guys in the early game. These are fine to play in the early game because you'll get a couple discounts. But mostly what I view these as are just very cheap costs for very good victory points. And right, two, two, two soil for nine, I would play this literally at any stage in the game, but I wouldn't necessarily play something that uh, gave me better bonuses first, right? Because this actually does give no bonuses along the way. And so any of the guys in this category, I think are viable to play because they're pretty cheap and give you essentially like dirt rebates. So they keep it rolling. Uh, they tend to not deal so much with the fauna though. So that is something important to, to talk about. Transitioning into cards that I would not be excited to play, I in general think the rainbow cards, like, they're not all bad, but rule of thumb, they're bad. Um, this is one that I'm not excited about. Yes, it triggers often, but it's paying one victory point for up to three victory points, but based off cards that are a little bit maybe awkward to play in my hand, it doesn't hit, like, any, there's no underlined or anything like that, no bold, so it's unlikely to, like, hit as many fauna. If it hits a fauna, I would play it. But if it doesn't, this is a card that I wouldn't be paying too much attention to. Cards that are expensive, that don't have habitats, a lot less likely to hit certain fauna things. I don't really care that it's got space for six growth things. That's not too important to me. And any of these things that score victory points but require other victory points to have been available to do them can sometimes put you in a position where you're actually like not able to access those uh, kinds of powers. Um Corn here, again, doesn't hit a lot of like fauna pleasing type traits. It's a little bit, it's not expensive, but it's not cheap. It costs soil to use for converting into like a couple victory points. There's nothing really exciting about this card. Unlikely to play it. Same as this guy right here. Same problem. Yes, this one actually does pay back soil, but I need to make sure that I have access to those sprout cubes. It's pretty expensive. The amount of time that it takes for this card to pay itself back, and it's unlikely that it pleases any of the fauna along the way um, mean that I'm very unlikely to play a card like this in the mid. For the end game, kind of the final six to eight cards that you're playing, you're looking to play the following, your wombo combo terrain, which I'm going to talk about separately in a moment, your fauna closers, meaning things that just meet the goals of the fauna that are telling you to meet things. You'll play even bad cards just to make sure that you've completed their objectives and also cards that continue to keep it rolling that make your life facilitated so there's not going to be as many examples in this section because the fauna closers are going to be different based on the fauna that have come out in your game but pleasing those guys is well worth your time in almost all instances so do what they tell you to especially if you're most of the way there um, I generally at this point want to be confident that I'm going to close on a fauna before I'm playing bad cards for it. So if I have, for instance, one card that is bold, then um, I'm not going to play a second card that is bold until I know that I have a third in my hand. 
All right, so for instance, I might play cards that are cheap, that meet certain conditions. It's nice if they score some extra points, but I'm probably not going to play them. Some really great uh, keep it rolling cards are these black cards that get, let you like pay other resources to discount them. So paying um, essentially one victory point here for three victory points and not having to use soil allows you to very easily keep it rolling. The uh, two mushroom guys are absolutely nuts because they allow you to convert useless cards of your hand into mulch, which is victory points, and they're worth good victory points themselves. These are some of my favorite closers in the game. And then um, there's a handful of terrains that give you the one-time bonuses, right? This essentially reads plus 17 points, which is well worth it. This one reads plus 14 points, but maybe more if you've got, you know, the, the kind of trees that support it. This one allows you to you know, convert a huge hand of cards if you had a game where you just happen to be drawing a bunch of stuff into a ton of victory points. So knowing that you have these options available makes a really big difference. Um, and then there's a whole stack of wombo combo terrains that I want to go through. So let me talk about those wombo combo terrains uh, now. The basic idea here is that you're hoping to draw into a one or some of these by the mid game. That's why we're prioritizing card draw early in the game, not only to draw on the cards that work well with the early or mid game plan, but then also allow us to say, oh, okay, I'm building towards that at the end game. And let me one, run through these. There's a huge stack of them, but I think planning for these is, in my opinion, the most overlooked aspect of Earth. All right, Gigantic Island, you're going to know whether this is good or not based on how many terrains you have, so that's pretty straightforward. Beach is always nuts. Just throw it up in the top left, right, or bottom corner or whatever. It's always at least two empty spaces if you throw it in the corner. This is 17 points for seven soil, which is a really great ratio. Putrefied land, most of the time I don't find this to be playable, but it does depend. You might have a compost heavy game. Blooming land, again, most of the time I don't find this to be playable, but for some reason you might have a gazillion cards in your hand and it is. Permafrost is almost always good because I'm advocating for playing lots of cheap cards throughout the course of the game and it itself is very cheap. I play this almost every single game I have it because it's not hard. On the other hand, fertile land I almost never play Play because I'm advocating playing cards that are cheap and keeping the game rolling so it's unlikely that that is helpful for the same reason that I play cards that are cheap it's often not the case that blossoming land is going to be that worthwhile also it is one of the most expensive terrains it can be really amazing but it's not that often that awesome for the opposite reason impoverished land is very good and I play it almost every single game mineral rich land I think is abysmal you should almost never end the game with extra soil to me this just means that you played the game poorly in the middle and you should have accelerated towards the end game differently do not plan for this card it seems like a big big mistake to me all right let's talk about these guys rocky mountains and anyone that's um, rewarding you for territories in uh, like habitats sorry Habitats? Habitats in another person's area. These are always good. They are always worth like minimum 16 points. Um, and they can be upwards of like 24 points for the 13 soil. Absolutely well worth it. And requires you to do absolutely no work yourself. You just play them, look for the opponent that has the most. And it's as simple as that. These cards are really good. They're just really expensive. And so having the soil to play them is the big part of the challenge. Um, this same thing with the ones that are for the yellows, blues, reds um, in an opponent's area, they are also very good, not as good, which is why they're a little bit cheaper, but very, very playable as well. And you'll know how good they are. I think these ones that um, reward you for having sprouts or uh, uh, growth things on various trees are too difficult to pull off in most games. The games will not have enough time to them that these four cards are worth your time building towards. They also just don't give enough points, I think, for what they are. They are clearly designed more for a casual meta rather than for a competitive meta, in my opinion. These cards are absolutely insane. Nine for 10 points alone is worthwhile. It's super easy to connect these to one diagonal point for plus five points. So nine for 15 is completely respectable. And if you get the absolute nuts by connecting it um, diagonally to four different things then it's absolutely out of this world so well worth it for even just one uh but by themselves like and and uh I think is not generally too hard to do one. The problem with these is that by the time you draw them, you already might have had a geometry of your map that makes it a little bit difficult to play them. 
Um, same thing with these continuous line guys. I actually love these continuous line guys so much that I try to structure my habitats in such a way throughout the course of the game to allow myself the luck of drawing into one of these if it's an option along the way um, because the upside of these being connected is very, very, very high. So if I draw one of these, I am trying to make my board work for these wombo combo terrains. All right, let's talk about geometry. What I mean by that is how your four by four is gonna look and things that you need to pay attention to for this. For some games, you actually literally don't need to care about the geometry at all. So don't worry about it too, too much. My goal in any game is to ideally find at least one ecosystem that cares about my geometry and then it becomes the thing that I care about in that game. So if I can, I'd like to choose things that you know have a column, a continuous line or anything like that. Um, and then this becomes my focus for how I'm going to build the board. I want to maximize it so that I can have diagonally adjacent these guys. I want to maximize it so that I can have different numbers of... Um, sprouts on each of these four different cards and so what that means is making sure that i only have one terrain in each column because terrains can't hold any sprouts and things like that so understanding what these cards are all asking you is a big part of learning the game and i'm not going to go into those things in the strategy guide that's on you to figure out um but responding to these uh these kind of directives from the ecosystem, I would say is the highest priority in terms of how I'm structuring my geometry. I did also put fauna in there. There are some that like reward you for like the diagonals or the columns. Those I think are very obvious. Like you should just play to those generally as quickly as possible. Um, and then if you're asking yourself the question of like, well, should I nuke one of my ecosystems for racing for this fauna? The answer is usually yes, if it's going to guarantee that you get first place. Uh, because, you know, for instance, this one here, it's six points for having completed like a column. And let's say we're talking about the giraffes, which reward you for having a column. It is worth getting the 15 rather than the 11 um, to be the first one to complete it because it also takes four points away from your opponent and requires you to do no additional work. Uh, I don't think there's much else interesting to talk about beyond that. The other thing I care about with the, uh, the geometry is adjacency points. Um, that's generally on your green uh, terrain card. So things that are like in this row or next to this, that's another thing that I'm going to be paying, paying a lot of attention to. That is a higher priority for me than the adjacency perks, things that uh, benefit you for doing things in certain rows because you're only going to trigger these a couple times over the course of the game. And I think the number of times you trigger them over the course of the game versus the benefits of this are... Uh, smaller and sometimes you can honestly do multiple so that's great and then the last thing I care about with the geometry points is speculating I talked about how much I really liked these continuous line guys so speculating on like what might be coming up um, is my final priority in terms of the geometry thing the last thing I want to say about the geometry thing is that most of the time it doesn't kind of matter if you lock in a column or a row or anything like that but just make sure that you are aware of the fact that when you have chosen to lock in the structure of your board that it is the structure that you want it to be locked in I don't have a lot of extra depth here I think that this is a part of the game that is fine but not terribly interesting and i think is not worth as many brain cycles for you as it can be the toughest games i find of earth by far are the ones where you have multiple of these ones that care about actually just pull the original one multiple of these ones that care about the location of various things and trying to juggle those at the same time is definitely the most taxing in my opinion I've spent this whole guide talking about various things that you should be paying attention to or that are important, but let's just focus on kind of what our objective is in terms of winning. Winning has kind of these primary things that we really need to care about. And I think none of these are terribly interesting, but it is just worth reiterating. So first of all, there are seven win conditions in this game, right? Not win conditions, but like things that are your objectives, I guess is what I should call them. The brown cards, the fauna, there's four of them, and the um, ecosystem cards, there's three of them. All seven of these things are what you should be paying attention to they are the most taxing part of the game and it is also the part of the game that most rewards experience so you can probably learn what's good or bad in this deck really quickly um just by kind of flipping through and, and making assessment based on the stuff that we've talked about already in this video or having just played a few times, like you'll pick that up. But learning like which fauna are difficult to complete or which of these ecosystems are more challenging than others to complete um, or which ones, you know, do give you the most bang for your buck for the work that you've put into them. 
because it's unlikely you can do absolutely everything, but you are responsible for juggling all seven of these things. And uh, that is somewhere where I do think experience does really come into play in this game, knowing essentially what's easier to deal with. So for instance, like, I think this is a very difficult ecosystem to work towards. And I wouldn't really make much of my game structure or plan around it because I'm going to be making growth tokens, but I don't really want to be taking the growth action because it detracts from the other things. However, that being said, earlier I kind of poo-pooed how good I think growth is. It's a little bit better in this game. That's all I really need to know. Fine. This card, however, does change the way that I play the game. I want to be playing cards and specific geometries in the row every single time and it means that i want to have multiples of the same things particularly for terrains this is going to limit essentially like where i can play certain things and what that's going to do with the cards that i play i know that i want to play terrains every game so structuring and planning out what my board look like looks like is going to require a lot of mental cycles when i'm playing this card certain cards of these are interesting or not so interesting like i really don't like the cards like this because it's basically just if you draw these cards you should play them because three of them is not that many and it's worth a lot of points to do it and hopefully you do draw them, congratulations. What it does tell me is that drawing um, more cards is slightly more valuable. Cards like the Atlantic Puffin are interesting because almost naturally you can get these throughout the course of the game. 10 plus cards with even things, you know, even counts zero. And I'm going to be playing a lot of things worth zero points because they tend to be very cheap and very free. It might change a card that I play. Like if I have two very similar cards, I'm going to choose this one because it's worth even points versus other odd points. But what this card really is reading as is the person who plants the most fastest is going to get this reward. Okay, I see what this is going on about. Kingfisher is actually quite similar to that. The person who plants the most fastest and has these kinds of cards is going to get a bonus. This will also change what I'm going to take from my initial cards at the beginning of the game. So looking at these win conditions, modifying your expectations and matching them to the fauna is the core of the game. It's actually one of my favorite parts of the design of this game is that these seven win conditions are the win conditions. <laughs> and people for some reason forget that. Um, I think that's really important. The second thing about what winning looks like is racing, right? We've talked about planting. Planting the best is really good, uh, but also just keeping up is generally fine. You know, you don't have to be the plant leader to be the person that's going to end the game. I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about how you can tempo out at the end of the game to try to make sure that even if you're not the person who gets the seven points for ending the game, that your tableau is going to be filled out. So that's going to be something I dive into just a second. I've talked about big terrain scores quite a lot recently. I just can't emphasize how important I think this is. At the tournament that I went to, the WSBG, where I did end up winning the whole tournament, two of the four games I won, I was not the player who ended the game. I only had 13 cards in my tableau, which most of the time is really, really bad. But because I focused on big terrain, scores when I saw the writing on the wall that I was not going to be the person who ended the game I still ended up winning those games big terrain scores are huge in this game and people seem to vastly underestimate them and then the last thing is the incidentals playing cards that are worth four points rather than two points throughout the course of the way and choosing to you know play this card that gets me some extra composting stuff most of the time your scores throughout the course of the game are going to be pretty similar to your opponents but you might get some extra little bits here and there, and those will add up to something that is significant along the way. All right, before I go into end game tempo, let me talk about beginning game decisions. So just these uh, climate cards as well as your, uh, your island cards that you're going to choose. So in general, this just follows the same advice that I've talked about throughout the course of this video. You want climate cards. The best climate cards are the ones that give you soil and uh, card draw because it's the beginning of the game. But that being said, mostly I make it so that my climate cards match my fauna if there are any matches there. So the Kingfisher wants blue cards, right? Or they want certain habitats or anything like that or even versus odd points or anything. I'll pay attention to those, um, but I'll generally choose these instead. The ones that I don't like are the if you choose the action ones. I think these tend to be weaker and because I play multiplayer games, uh, they tend to be triggered less often. Uh, the blue action does seem to be a little bit weaker just in the sense of opponents don't choose the blue action. I didn't explicitly talk about this in a video, so I guess I'll do this now. I think the blue action is better than the red action. Um, you saw that, that in my my plays, I take blue as much as I take red and uh, other opponents online take red twice as much as they take blues. I just think that the fact that you can convert those sprouts into soil means that it's the primary thing. And people, I think, have a little bit of a tunnel vision on red. So I think uh, being aware that blue is is 
just another version of the red action is really, really helpful. In terms of your islands here, um, I think that the powers, you're not going to be surprised what I think is good and not good. Um, anything that gives you a discount tends to be pretty good. Things that are, if you choose the action, are not good because they're not going to trigger that often. Things that give you points for planting certain things are not good. But things that give you um, soil or, uh, you know, cubes are a little bit better than these ones that give you points for doing these things. That being said, this is a lot of complicated stuff to say that really what I care about is actually what I start with at the beginning of the game. Usually when you have your two-sided islands, there is an expensive side and a cheap side. And almost always between these, you should be choosing the side that has the fewest victory points because it gives you the most starting resources. There are very few exceptions to this rule. Fill around with them and, and see for yourself like what you like. I'm not going to tier list these guys or anything. Take the one that's fewer victory points and you're probably going to be happier almost all the time. Okay, I want to talk about end game pacing. And so the numbers that I'm putting here are the number of cards that each of these players has played. So we're player three in this, in this situation. We've got eight cards in play compared to player one and player four's 13 cards in play. It's been a rough game for us. We haven't taken the plant action. Player two, similarly, has just been like completely out-tempoed. And we are in trouble as the end of the game is approaching here. It's now our turn here. And... Uh, We've got to decide what it is that we want to do. We know that the end of the game is rapidly, rapidly approaching. But uh, at the same time, like we think that there is a chance we could win this game. We absolutely want to play as many cards into our tableau as possible. And so the question is, what should we be doing to kind of control the pace of the game? Now, part of the core structure of this little bit more ridiculous example that I've set up here is that two of the players are interested in ending the game and they are jockeying for position against each other. And two of the players here are interested in essentially colluding with one another to make the game go as long as possible. That being said, both player two and player three are interested in taking the plant action to accelerate their situation, right? Taking lots of like blues and reds and yellow actions probably isn't to their advantage. There's a good chance that player one and player four here have more infrastructure than we do. And so let's just pretend that our cards are roughly equivalent. We're not gonna get an advantage over any of the other players for taking blue or red or yellow because player one and player four have played like some cheap bad cards, you know, to make it so that they got into this situation. Um, obviously, if I'm very, very good at taking a certain action, everyone else is bad at it, it changes the equation. But I think most of the time, actually, that's not going to be the case. You're going to be in a situation where it's either worse for you or kind of equivalent-ish, um, aside from, of course, the benefit that you get for being the person who chooses what the action is and that additional perk that comes there. Let's start with the first thing. Player three in this instance should not plant. Planting in this instance puts player four to 14. And then player four is highly incentivized to plant, going to 16 and ending the game. That means that player three will have gone up to 11 here, plus two for their plant and plus one more. And this is really not ideal for them. Um, the only instance in which we should choose to plant here is where we are like basically positive that player four will not be able to take the plant action on their next turn based on maybe the number of soil or cards they have in their hand or what they've been playing recently. We should be really, really confident. But let's assume that we're in a board state where we can't have that level of confidence. That that's going to be the case. And so instead here, we need to decide to do something else. And probably what we're going to do is get resources. Some we probably are behind in terms of like soil. So we're going to take a blue or red action instead. And then player four here is not super likely to take the plant action. Why is that? Because player four, if they take the plan action, goes to 15. This player one will go to 14. And then player one on their next turn is going to take the plant action, going to 16, and taking away from player four the capacity to end the game. So player four says to themselves, well, you know what? I instead am going to take some other action that makes me rich so I can play some Wombo Combo Terrains in my hand. Even if they do play the plant action this is still okay for player three because having an additional round here is going to be helpful part of the reason that player three also took a blue or red action is because they wanted to make player two as rich as player three we want to be able to collude which means that i want player two to be planting as much as i do in the player three seat because i'm really competing with player one and four here so i'm looking to cooperate with player two to put me in a position that's most likely to win the game here so um Let's go, let's talk about this first situation where player four has decided that they are going to go ahead and plant. Go to 15 anyway. Player one plants and goes to 16 on their next turn. That means that both of these guys have gone here to 10. 
And then player two and player three can both take the plant action, getting an additional three cards planted, right? Before player four ends the game with both of these plant actions being a dud for these players, okay? So this is a fine situation, right? Player four having chosen the plant action is much better than player three having chosen the plant action on the preceding round. But let's say that player four doesn't want to lose this race. And so they decide to take some of their action instead. What they're likely to take is more resources, more more soil, which means that player two and player three have more soil, which is important to us. And then player one is now in the interesting position because we've taken resources, taken resources, and then we're on to player one. In the really interesting position here of saying, okay, well, if I plant and I go to 15, then this player goes to 14. And if these guys plant, I am going to um, be the person that gets to 16 first. And almost certainly this means that player one is going to choose the plant action in this case. Um, the reason for this is that these guys are incentivized to plant because player 14 with uh, player four with 14 will definitely take the plant action on their turn to end the game. So that means that player one is going to choose to plant. And if they choose to dilly dally, that's even better for us. But they're going to choose to plant, which is going to put us all up to nine here. 14 over here and then we're going to do is take a plant action here and a plant action here which is going to be another three for all of us and unfortunately we're a little bit shorter than we would have been had player four chosen a plant which is again why player four should not choose to plant at the end of the turn there and player four is going to move up to 16 here and then take some of their action to end the game but we will have gained at least these four cards while our opponents gained three which is a little bit better for us um so this concept of hey, I want to make sure that the game doesn't end off my pace, right? Dictated to us that we weren't going to plant on this previous action when we had eight, even though we're very far behind because of the way that player four would have been incentivized to end the game, okay? Let me set up another situation here. All right, again, we're player three. This is only a three-player game this time, and we are at 10 cards to our opponents 13 and 12. So we've been outpaced. This is a really common scenario. The player three would be in this position where they're behind their opponents. It's their action now, and the question is, what should they do? Okay, so it's either plant or no plant, and no plant in this case is probably just getting more soil, so they have the opportunity to play more cards, kind of accrue more resources here. And we're going to walk through sort of the different logic trains here. If player three chooses to not plant here, just get more resources, then player one here has a choice of either planting or not plant planting. If they choose to plant and they go to 15, right, then we go to 13 here, we go to 11 here, and then if either player two or player three chooses to plant, the game is going to end thanks to player one. So player one is definitely going to plant if we choose a no plant action in this case, right? Now we might essentially like collude and say, hey, let's not end the game, not end the game. And then maybe player one says, okay, well, I'll definitely end the game and I'll go to 16 here and I'll put this player to 14 and this player to 12. And then player two says, okay, well, I'm a, I definitely want to have a full tableau, so I'll plant, which will put this player to 13. And then player three now plants and goes to 15 cards. So actually we're suddenly only one, um, one card behind by having put player one into this situation of having to double plant here. Okay, so this is actually kind of ideal. If player one plants, and then these players essentially collude by not planting, Player one is forced to end the game with a plant for only one action, and they have the time left to plant their other things, okay? Now, player one could choose to not plant here as well, all the way back at the beginning, right? Player three chooses some soil. Player one chooses not to plant. And then let's say player two chooses to plant. They go up to 14, up to 14 here, up to 11 here. This becomes a little bit more dangerous territory, Player two has now made a choice that means that player one is going to be guaranteed to be able to end the game on their turn. Player three now is incentivized to plant. And then player one has the kind of weird choice of planting for just one card, but if they want those seven points over player two, they probably are going to choose to plant. Player two will then choose something else, but player three, ha ho, we get to go back up to 16 in this situation so player three is very very happy if player two uh, sorry if player one chooses not to plant and then player two does choose to plant um 
Player two, I think, is very incentivized to choose to plant in this instance because if player three chooses to plant going to 12, player one goes to 14, and then the game's going to end anyway. So player two is very incentivized to plant if player one doesn't choose to plant. Okay, so then what about a different situation? What if player three does choose to plant here? If they choose to plant, they go to 12. Player one goes to 14, which is basically going to guarantee that player one is going to end the game on their next turn. Player one plants. They go up to 16 here, end the game. Player two goes to 14. Player three goes to 13. Player two chooses the plant action because they want to make sure that they get to 16, right? Player three going to 14. And then player three actually shoots up to 16. Well, that's really interesting because... Player three, by choosing to plant, actually just triggers a plant race around where everybody wants to get to 16 and actually gets themselves to 16. Whereas in the first scenario where they passed, player one pant planted, they actually, even if they colluded with player two, only end with 15. So in this case, player three, assuming they have sufficient resources, is actually incentivized to set player one up to end the game because player two is then incentivized to say, okay, I need to finish my tableau, which actually allows player three to plan to end the game. And the only advantage that they have over player one here is these two wasted actions where they plant and plant and player one is not able to do anything. So this gap that we have of being 10 cards, two or three cards behind our opponent, we can control by seeing what the flow is of our opponents. But of course, we need to have sufficient resources and hopefully the cards in our hand to know that we can afford to plant these six cards. That's the real challenge that we face. So a lot of times we're going to be put in a position where we don't have enough cash to do that. And we're going to have to say to ourselves, OK, I'm choosing to take soil, knowing that essentially my opponents um, are going to be in this position of plant and what am i going to be i'm probably going to be at 15 instead of 16 anyway um, but you have to assess your hand your cards because you really should be able to say this is what i'm going to play between now and the end of the game so thinking through your opponents assuming that they really highly prioritize being the person to end the game and they also highly prioritize being the person to get any person to get to a full 16 tableau is um really really helpful in determining whether you should move the game towards closer to conclusion or not as you get to the end of the round. Hopefully that was helpful. Let me step back and like resummarize kind of what I think is really important in Earth. Obviously, meeting the goals in this game is kind of the main thing. Managing those and thinking about it is really important. Early game, we just care about getting soil and drawing cards. Mid game, we're just trying to meet our objectives. This is a game where very, very quickly we are moving into a place where it's can this meet the objective or is it cheap? Those two questions, can this meet the objective or is it cheap? And I just keep asking myself that over and over again until we get to the end of the game. We've hit 75 minutes. This is probably far too long already, but I hope this has been a helpful video to you. Uh, leave me some comments in the, in, the, in the comment section below. What do you think? What are some strategies that you think about? What has this changed about your perspective? Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day, everyone.